All right. Uh, welcome back, folks. We're going to uh, look at part eight now of the Synchronizing the Gospels series. And uh, this one is titled The Prophecy of Jonah and the Crucifixion Timing. So again, we always want to start with prayer. Let's do that. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just ask you to be here with us and with those gathering online and watching the DVDs later. Father, we are searching. We are desiring to know the truth. We do have biases. We admit it freely. At least I hope we all do because we all do. But Father, we want our biases to be aligned with your word and not the other way around. And so we just pray that you will send your Holy Spirit. Please uh, speak through me, Father. Be with the listeners and be glorified in, in all of this. And Father, may we, to your glory, be able to share your true gospel without the mixing of the sacred with the profane. And so we ask for that blessing in Yeshua's holy name and on this study. Amen. Amen. So again, to quickly review, we're going to do a very short review this time because we just had a few minutes between, um, is Messiah's mission was to come to send fire. And that was his ultimate goal. And we read that in Matthew 12, 49 to 50, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I, if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? So every piece of the prophetic picture had to be done, from baptism with water to the outpouring with fire. And so we did see that happening from the moment that John made the prophetic announcement, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, from that moment, he was the Passover lamb, and he completed his messianic ministry with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit displayed in tongues of fire on the apostles, those gathered in the upper room. So in our last talk, we went up to week 25 of Yeshua's ministry. And how many weeks of ministry does he have? 70. 62 weeks. And then in the 63rd week, he's going to die. So the rebuilding of the wall and the, yes, he has 70 weeks of ministry, but the specific part of rebuilding the wall and, and the street, that portion of his ministry had to be finished in 62 weeks because that was the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. So we are now looking at the 26th week, and boy, oh boy, was that a significant week in his ministry. <laughs> okay, in the 26th week of Yeshua's ministry, Luke chapter 8 verses 1 to 3 records that he traveled and preached with his 12 apostles. Remember in the 25th week he appointed 12, so the 5 grew to 12. Matthew 12, 22 to 23 tells of how Yeshua healed a blind and dumb man who was possessed by a demon. And when the people saw the miracle of this healing, they saw the sign that he was the Messiah. How do we know that? Because the Bible says that they were amazed and that they said among themselves, is not this the son of David? And the branch prophecies that we that I shared with you in part two of this series, it's well known that Yeshua, the branch, would be the son of David. And so what they are saying in plain English is, okay, he's healed the blind and the dumb that was possessed by the demons. The demons are gone. Is not this the Messiah? That's what they were saying in plain English. Now, if you were in the Pharisee camp and you were resisting him, that would be big for you. You would now have every cannon in your arsenal trained on him. He would be public enemy number one, or you were going to repent. Were they going to repent? No. So he's public enemy number one. <laughs> and they are coming after him and they have to deal with the issue that there are people who are starting to believe he's the Messiah. And if he's the Messiah, why don't the Jewish leaders go along with it? That's big. All right. So this prompted the Pharisees to prove that he's not. They want to prove that he is not the Messiah. And so that is why they began to tempt him and test him specifically on one subject. Let's not be random. It wasn't random. Can you authenticate that you're the Messiah? If you're the Messiah, I want you to prove it. 
Okay, so the 26th week of Yeshua's ministry, the Pharisees come to him. Matthew 12, 38 to 40 says, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees said, Master, they're being respectful while stabbing him in the back when he's not looking, right? <laughs> we would see a sign from thee. Now, there have been so much... Uh, supposition about what they're looking for a sign about but dear ones just look at the context that the people are starting to believe he's the messiah and his response makes it very plain that the authenticity that they're seeking is his messiahship because they want to undermine it and the fact is he's going to give them one key proof that he is the messiah all right some say that the sign of Jonah was proving that Jonah was an authentic prophet of Yahweh. It had nothing to do with that. And, of course, if we look at it that way, it's impossible to understand the three days and three nights prophecy. The sign of Jonah is always given on only one context, and that is, it is the Pharisees seeking proof of Messiah's authenticity. Let's read it all. Matthew 12, 38 to 40. Messiah... Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but, except for, save the sign of the prophet Jonas, or Jonah. It's the translation from Greek there. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This is one of the most significant, if not the most significant, of all the prophecies because this is the one that proves he's the Messiah. We had better get this right. John 2, 18, then answered the Jews. This is a, a term in, whenever you see the Jews in the Bible, a lot of them are Jewish, but the word Jews means the Pharisee religious leaders, Okay. So what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? So in Matthew 16, we see the Pharisees have come to him with the Sadducees. They're tempting him. They desired that he would show them a sign from heaven. And Yeshua says unto them, hypocrites. This is a good picture of a hypocrite. In Greek, a hypocrite is the mask that you wear in the theater to hide your true face. Was that a good, accurate description? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> so there was only one sign given of Messiah's authenticity. Now, if we take it and adulterously twist it around, the pagan gods, then we've become part of the wicked and adulterous generation. Now, I think it's kind of interesting that there's a very, Hebrew is a very pictorial, graphic, hands-on kind of language. And I like that because I'm a very simple thinker and I like to be able to touch it, you know? And I think, I think that's just a great way to teach and God's a good teacher. In, um, in teaching years ago, I remember some of the best ways to get the students to understand concepts was to put it in their hands. You want to understand that two plus three is five. You give them two beans and three beans and how many beans have you got? Touch it, right? Well, in Hebrew, you get words that are very physical, very, you can touch it. The word wicked is an interesting word coming from the sanctuary. And what they would do is um, when the priests' linen robes wore out, pause, what do linen robes represent? Christ's righteousness. That's right. But when the priests' linen robes were wearing out, they had one yet use. They would be stripped and into strips, and then that white robe would be twisted all up to make a wick, and it was used in the sanctuary candlestick. It was the wick in the candlestick. And so the concept is to take that wickedness is to take that which was righteous and to twist it all up. Okay? <laughs> That's a very graphic picture. So when Yeshua was here, he was fulfilling a feast of Yahweh, when he died, he was not fulfilling any of Dagon's pagan things. He wasn't fulfilling a Jewish set aside time either. It was nothing about man. He was fulfilling the feasts of Yahweh. 
And so he says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign shall be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. So twisting the word, twisting the truth is the definition of wickedness. Now, some twist the word and say that Matthew 1240 doesn't say three days and three nights in the original text. Okay, and the original text wasn't Greek, right? They say Christ had to be taken out of the tomb quickly or he would have experienced corruption. And in Psalms, it says that the Holy One would not be suffered to see corruption. They also say that those who believe three days and three nights believe that Christ really raised on the fourth day because after all, as I'm going to show you, the fourth day would have been Sunday. And that you have to pick and choose which prophecies to believe because they don't all align perfectly. So you need to get rid of Matthew 12, 40, as it just doesn't fit in the other prophecies on the subject. I'm not making these things up. I'm, I'm actually quoting things that we found on people's websites about this. Okay? So these are the things that are being said about the three days and three nights prophecy. And here's the last one. The sign of Jonah was about being a prophet to Nineveh. So when the Pharisees came, they were asking Yeshua, was Jonah a prophet to Nineveh authentically? Is that in the context, dear ones? No. We can see that it was a sign about Messiah's authenticity. And Messiah was quoting from Jonah. In fact, you find out about it, that Jonah was in the whale's belly for how long? In Jonah 1.17. Now Yahweh had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish. How long? Three days and three nights. Now, whenever Yahweh wants to show that something is important, he repeats it. How many times does he need to repeat it to show unequivocally that he has established it? Two times. If he wants to show that he's established it and boy, oh boy, pay attention, you might get three. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. But it's not lessened that it's two. But I will tell you this. If he repeats it a whole bunch more than that, then you better underscore it, stamp it, <laughs> focus on it, because boy, is it important. Do you know that the three days and three nights prophecy is repeated more than any other prophecy in the Bible? Why? Because if we don't have a Messiah, we don't have a Savior. And if we don't have the true gospel, we can't preach to the world, and the end of the world isn't going to be able to come without that happening first. This is like the heart of it. Who is the Messiah? Can we authenticate him? His authentication, his seal of messianic truth is in the three days and three nights prophecy. And all of the false Christs do not complete the three day and three night prophecy of Jonah. Dagon, Tammuz, pick a name, pick a culture. They have a crucifixion story. And their crucifixion story is what is taught in Christianity today. Indeed, it's all part of the false gospel. Three days and three nights was the sign Yeshua said would authenticate that he is the one and only Messiah. And you can find it in John 2.19, Matthew 12.38-40, to 40, um, Matthew 16.21, Matthew 17.22-23, Mark 8.31, Mark 9.31, Mark 10, 33 to 34, Luke 9, 22, and Luke 18, 31 to 34. Do you think this is an important prophecy in the eyes of heaven? Amen. I think so. So if they can't do away with it in length of time, then they come after it in vicinity. Okay? Because we can't believe that this is how long he was in the grave. After all, didn't he die on a Friday? Wasn't he resurrected at Easter sunrise? Doesn't every good Christian know this? No. <laughs> and so to do away with the idea of the three days and three nights, they say, well, he was in the area. The concept of in the heart of the earth is just a region, the region of Jerusalem. But actually, he doesn't even fully fulfill that because you see him going out to Bethany for a time. He's not fully in Jerusalem for three days and three nights before his death. So 
And also, let's look at the shadow picture. Yeshua has given us the type, the symbology of Jonah. Is Jonah on the beach during the three days and three nights? Is Jonah in the sea somewhere swimming around the whale or the fish or the whatever? <laughs> for three, Where is Jonah for three days and three nights? He is in the whale's belly, which he described as Sheol. I've never been in a whale's belly. I honestly would not want to sign up for that trip. <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can only imagine that a living hell is probably an accurate depiction of the belly of a whale. And so that's what he said it was like. It was literally 72 hours that Jonah was there. And Yeshua said, the sign of the prophet Jonas, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now in Christianity, we've bought into the entire pagan sun worship stuff. We don't even know we've done it, but we have, as, a, as a Protestantism has. Um, weeping for Tammuz is an expression that you will find in Ezekiel. And it's uh, women weeping for Tammuz. And that doesn't mean a whole lot to us today. If you were to face value, read the verses in Ezekiel that talk about this. It looks like you would have Israelite women doing this. You get the idea that Tammuz is a pagan deity. So you can see some elements of paganism coming in to the supposed people of Yah. But actually the expression women weeping for Tammuz if we were to use modern English to translate that, it would be keeping Easter. This was a ceremony. It was the part of the worship of the false one, the Phrygian crucifixion one. So the son of Semiramis from Babylon, they have different names depending on which culture you're in. Remember the Tower of Babel where the languages were changed, but they all had the same false gods. So it's the same pagan trinity, just different names, but they have the same birthdays, the same crucifixion, etc. The son of Semiramis was called Tammuz, and at the age of 40, according to their pagan teachings, he was killed by a wild boar. And in the spring of the year, a Lent of 40 days was set aside by Babylonian Ishtar worshippers to weep for him. And this is from Easter, It's Story and Meaning, page 58, by Alan Watts. And you read about this, um, this concept in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13 to 14. And the heavenly guide, speaking to Ezekiel, says to him, I'm going to show you, and he uses the strongest vile word in the Bible, I'm going to show you abominations. There's nothing stronger in the negative, in all descriptions in the Bible. And he said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of Yahweh's house. Whose house? Yahweh. Yahweh's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Um, this ancient stone carving here shows the human worshipers. And so they're little and the God is the big one. And this is a, a picture of Tammuz, the one that they're worshiping. And his symbols are all around him, one of them being the pine cone. And so you see the, they're, they're a little bit worn away, but those pine cone tips, and you will see that still done and uh, kept, especially the papal power uses a lot of that um, element. And so you see a lot of it in the art. The Babylonian account of the crucifixion goes like this, and I'm quoting now from Graham's Deceptions and Myths of the Bible, page 348. Ishtar and her divine son, quote-unquote Tammuz, cru was crucified and buried and then resurrected. And at the crucifixion, Ishtar stood the cross beside. So basically, he's killed in a wild boar hunt. Have you ever wondered why they eat ham on Easter Sunday? It's because from ancient times, they believed and taught that you could ingest the power of the god by eating its symbol. And also, in honor of him, they would have a ham or a pig with an apple in its mouth. And going back to medieval times with knights and whatever, you would see that on the Christmas table. And again, it was because he was gored through the heart by the tusks of this boar, uh, a male pig, wild pig. 
and um, the apple would be a symbol of his heart. So after he was dead, they put him on a cross and they, uh, they uh, said that he was resurrected. Guess when? Easter sunrise. That's right. Of course, Easter. So the Phrygian celebration of the crucifixion is described as follows. And again, I'm quoting, this is from Fraser's Golden Bough, page 229. A pine tree was cut in the woods and brought into the temple of Sibyl. That's Semiramis, but a different culture. So her name is changed. It was treated almost as a divinity. Have you ever seen the pine tree treated as a divinity? Kind of do the same things today, don't we? It was decked with violets and the effigy of a young man, Addis, in this culture, tied to the stem of the cross. It was followed by the day of blood. The high priest first drew blood from his own arms and then the others gashed and slashed themselves. And if you compare this with the story of Elijah, Elijah the prophet on the top of Mount Carmel, you will see that this is a very old practice that in the worship of the sun god, they would gash and slash themselves because there had to be lots of blood. And they splattered the altar and the sacred tree with blood. The effigy was afterwards laid in a tomb. And when night fell, sorrow was turned to joy, a light was brought, and the tomb was found to be empty. The next day was the festival of the resurrection, and ended in carnival and license called the Hilaria, including a sacramental meal and a baptism of blood. And um, this is some depictions of it from an ancient stone, and uh, that would have been from Egypt. Now, scarecrows are actually idols. They are um, Tammuz idols. And you read about them in Jeremiah 10, verse 5. Um, because what they started doing after that initial crucifixion of Tammuz himself is they would have a sacrifice every year with lots of blood and put the young person that was sacrificed out in the cucumber field and the blood would drip down into the field and that would cause the fertility of the ground um, because the God's blood in effigy. It was a terrible, terrible ritual. And that's why Jeremiah could write about it and say that it was such a vile thing. Their idols, Jeremiah says, are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. They cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. So he's saying, this, is this your God? This is not. And this crucifixion story happened way back in the time of ancient Babylon. So the devil, anticipating how Yeshua would really die, had already created a false messiah to turn the people from the true. Kind of like vaccinating them so they would never get the disease, right? So in the Phrygian crucifixion story, we have Dagon's Day, Good Friday, as it's called. And by the way, what are you supposed to eat on Friday? Good Friday. Fish. fish. Why? Because Dagon was the fish god. And the hat was the fish hat. And so the way they, they tell you the story of this sun god of Dagon is that in the daytime he would ride his ship through the sky being the sun. And when the night came and the sun set and he went down, he became the fish. And so his symbol was the fish. And I'd like to remind all of the wonderful story of how the Ark of Yahweh was placed before Dagon, the, the, <laughs> the fish god, and what happened to the fish god. <laughs> it gets broken over. That's right. So anyway, but the day that Dagon was crucified um, was Friday, Good Friday, and he was in the tomb. How long? Was it three days and three nights? No, because he was crucified on the Friday. He was buried Friday night, and then you have Sabbath, or they wouldn't have called it that. And he would have been in the tomb throughout those hours. And then at Easter sunrise, he resurrects. So we do not have three days and three nights, do we? It's only parts of three days. But actually not, because there's not even a part of all of Friday, is there? So unless we're extremely generous, he's not in the tomb here. One night, two nights, not three nights. One day, not two days, he does not fulfill the prophecy of Jonah. Not the authentic Messiah. Okay? 
Yeshua gave the sign. Leviticus 23, verse 9 to 12, talks to us about the first fruits. And we need to deal with this because it deals with the timing that he comes out of the tomb. And if we're talking about the sign of Jonah, we want to see, did he fulfill three days and three nights? So it is believed that Yeshua resurrected on the day of first fruits. Anybody heard that teaching? Okay. He didn't. But we'll get there. <laughs> okay. Leviticus 23, 9 to 12. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you. What day? On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now, what day is after the weekly Sabbath? The first day of the week, or as it's paganly known, Sunday, just for clarity. So the day of first fruits is Sunday after, um, uh, during this Passover time and love and bread time, that Sunday specifically. And so the priest is going to wave the first fruits grain on the day of first fruits. First fruits is on Sunday. We see it. It's in the Torah. Okay. Now, Yeshua's resurrection. Was that a fulfillment of first fruits? First Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? Yes. Messiah's resurrection was a fulfillment of first fruits. So then how can I suggest that he didn't raise on the day of first fruits? Because, dear ones, first fruits is a feast that happens in stages. And by the way, I'm not going to go into this today, but Passover is similar. It happens in stages. Only some parts of the feast actually take place on the day. And Passover is just like that, too. Here are the three stages of first fruits. Now, I cannot tell you this scripturally. Well, yes, I can. Um, but I can't prove that they did this to the grain. There's no Bible verse. What I can do is I can show you from Hebrew history that this is how they did it, what I'm about to tell you. But the reason I validate the Hebrew history is because in the crucifixion story, Yeshua, Yah, did these three stages. Exactly. So I, I believe, just as the Hebrew people say, that there are some elements of what they tell you from their oral Torah that are carrying on things that were said and done and known to do in keeping of the holy times, going way back. Some of it has been paganized and it's added to. I'm not suggesting that it's all right. How do you know the difference? If you can find a fulfillment in the life of Christ, then even if it's only from Hebrew history, pay attention. Here's one of those things, the three stages of first fruit. So the first stage was the marking of the barley grain. Now the Bible does tell us that first fruits was barley grain. Okay, it does tell us that. And we know that we were to have the, the first fruits of the barley at the timing of the Passover. And what this is the history part. The high priest on the day of first fruits would go out from Jerusalem and he would look for the barley that was Abib. And it would be early barley because the barley harvest continued until Shavuot, Pentecost. So the first fruits is the part of the harvest that is the first part. And there's going to be a lot more grain than the first fruits. So the whole harvest comes in at Pentecost, and then you change to the wheat harvest from barley. That's how it went. So on the day of Passover, what day? Passover. Passover the high priest would go out and he would mark the barley by putting a cord around it. He wouldn't harvest it. He just put a cord around it. And he would say, this is the first fruits barley by putting a cord around it. The second stage of first fruits took place on Shabbat. And that was the cutting of the grain in, in Yeshua's life. It took place on Shabbat. It would depend on when your first fruits was, but it was a day, it was a, a um, it was a day, a couple days later. Can't talk. <laughs> All right. And the cutting of the grain was when they would go out and they would see, okay, here's where the high priest court is. This is the grain to cut and they would harvest it. It would be put into a bundle. But would it be waved? Not yet. They would wait until 
first fruits day, and then the grain would be waved. The only part of first fruits that actually happened on first fruits was the waving of the grain. Now I want to show you the marking of the grain, the cutting of the grain, and the waving of the grain in Yeshua's fulfillment. Here's the marking. First fruits part one, the marking of the barley. This took place on Passover. We know that because what day did Yeshua die? Passover. Okay, Matthew 27, 50 to 52. Yeshua is on the cross. That's the context. Yeshua, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. What is happening right now? He's dying. Okay? And at the precise moment when he dies, what happens? The earth did quake and the rocks rent, which means torn open, and the graves were opened. Okay? There are graves opened in the earthquake that took place as Yeshua died. But did anyone come out of those graves? No. The graves are opened because the barley is just marked. It's like the high priest <laughs> put the cord <laughs> around the barley and said, this is the first fruits. And that happens on what day? When did he die? Wednesday. He died on Passover. All right. So the graves are marked until when? The second stage of first fruits took place just before the Sabbath ended in the crucifixion story. And this was the time when the first fruits barley was cut. Just before the sun set, the Savior arose from the tomb. Immediately after this, the sleeping saints were raised from those marked graves as the first fruits of the final harvest of saints to be raised on the great day of Yah's return. Now, I'm not going to get into um, the full timing of everything right now because I'm only showing you the Jonah prophecy. We haven't gotten to the 63rd week of Yeshua's life. And when we do, I'm, I'm prayerfully planning to go there in depth. But for right now, I would just like to say I'm going to do this much. I can, I believe, prove that Yeshua went into the grave before the sun set and that he came out of the grave before the sun set. So bear with me. I have a scripture or two to show you for that one. Before I do, I want to show you the cutting of the barley. So what happened when he died? On Passover, the earthquake, the rocks rent, the graves were opened. Continue now in Matthew 27, 53 to 54. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves when? After his resurrection. Did he resurrect on Passover? No. So the graves are opened, like the marking of the barley, but no one comes out until just after Yeshua himself. He's the first fruits. They're part of his grain, but he is the preeminent first fruits. And so he resurrects first, and then they, coming out of those opened graves. And they had laid open for the three days and three nights. And, when, and what did they do afterwards? Are they instantly taken to heaven? Is this resurrection happening on first fruits? So they're going to go and be waved before the Father's throne instantly? No. There is time after they come out of the ground to do an important work. Boy, that must have knocked people's socks off. I wonder if they had newspaper presses or anything that they wrote news about. And I'm sure they had town criers. And even without cell phones and Facebook, I bet the word got around pretty fast. Because there were people coming up out of the graves and telling them, we're the first fruits. He is the first fruits. And because of him, we're alive. And I'm sure there were some people there they must have known. And so what does it say they did? They had several hours to witness. They came up out of their graves and they went into the holy city and they appeared unto many. What a night. Now, when the centurion and that they that were watching were with him, watching Yeshua, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. 
They saw the authenticity of him as the Messiah. They saw the proof. This is the centurion. He's got more spiritual eyes than the people who should. Now comes the one that the only part of first fruits that actually happens on the day of first fruits is the waving or presenting of the barley. The third stage of first fruits took place on Sunday morning at the time of the waving of the grain, 9 a.m. And this was the time when the first fruits barley was waved in presentation to Yah. This was the moment when Yeshua ascended to his father and his sacrifice was accepted. And because of his acceptable sacrifice, the resurrected saints were accepted into heaven. The psalmist portrayed this exciting first fruits procession. You can read it in Psalms 24, verse 7 to 10. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? Yah, strong and mighty. <laughs> Yah, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? This is rhetorical call and response. Can you imagine the angels singing it? They know the answer. But the answer comes, Yah of hosts, he is the king of glory, Selah. Many confuse the time of the resurrection with the time of the waving of the first fruits grain. But the Bible tells us that the resurrected saints had time to witness in the city and the women had time to encounter the Savior before he ascended. In fact, he said to Mary in the garden, don't de it, it says, don't touch me, but the better translation is, don't detain me, because I have not yet what? Ascended, Ascended unto my Father. He resurrected, and it wasn't yet the day of first fruits, the timing of the waving of the grain. But at the precise moment when heaven had given the shadow picture of the grain waving, that was the precise moment when this incredible chorus took place in heaven. So the Phrygian crucifixion that tells you that, that Yeshua died on Good Friday, that's not so. That was Dagon's day. The one that tells you that he resurrected on Easter Sunday, that's not so. The Lord of the Sabbath, the master of the Sabbath, raised on his day. And it was three days and three nights from the time he died, because he didn't die on Friday at all. To know the timing of his death, we have to go to Daniel 9, 24 to 27, because every part of the prophecy of Messiah had to be fulfilled. In Daniel 9, 24 to 27, it tells you how long he would minister before he died. And after three score, which is a score is 20, so after 60 and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. That means he would be killed, he would die. So we do see our little timeline here. We had the 62 weeks and we are in it right now. Here he has given the Jonah code or the, um, as, as Michael Rood calls it, I think that's an interesting title. But in the scriptures, we see the concept that it's the prophecy of Jonah. And this prophecy was given in the 26th week of his 62 week ministry. And in the 63rd week after the 62 weeks, he did indeed die. Now, I want to show you an interesting piece of this prophetic puzzle. In Isaiah 46, verse 9, the Bible tells us that Yahweh declares the end from the beginning. And if we read that with Gentile thinking, you would get that he always knew what would happen in the end. Even when the world was beginning, he knew how it would end. That's how we Gentiles would read it. And is that true? Yes. Is that all that he's saying? Not by a long shot. If you look at the word beginning, Yahweh declares the end from the beginning. You look at the word beginning in your strongs, you will find that it's the Hebrew word Bereshith. And Bereshith is actually the name of the first book of the Torah. We call it Genesis. But in Hebrew, it's Bereshith. Yahweh declares the end from Genesis. Hmm. So, if we're going to understand the end, we have to go back to Genesis. Now, I want to show you a detail that must come in, and I'm going to show you that little Genesis picture in a moment. When did Yeshua actually plan to die? Not only the 63rd um, week of his ministry, but in the midst of the 63rd week. Midst. In the midst of the week. 
How do we know that was when he was going to die? It doesn't say those precise words, although it does say he would be cut off after the 62nd week, which does mean die. But the reason we can understand die here as well is because when did the sacrificing stop? When he died. He was the, the what it all pointed to. It was like a stand-in for him. All those animals that were dying or being sacrificed, I mean, they were pointing to him. They were not good enough to forgive sin. They were a promissory note that the real sacrifice of heaven would die for us. So when he died, the sacrificing and the offering of oblations ceased, right? So now we can see that we are indeed talking about Calvary when it says this happens in the midst of the week. Hold that thought. We're coming back to it. Okay, let's look for a moment at this um, prophecy from Daniel 9 a little bit more deeply. It says, From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. From the going forth is actually dawn. Now, sometimes translators translate it dawn, and they really make a mess a few times when they do. And sometimes they translate it beginning or from the going forth. And so here in this particular case, we do see that it's it's the dawn or the going forth, the beginning of, the utterance of, and all of that is in the meaning from Strong's number 4161. From the commencement or the utterance of the commandment to restore, and the word restore, you think of building a city, building up walls again, and that is how it happened in the time of Nehemiah when this was physically fulfilled the first time around. But the primary meaning has always been spiritual. And the word restore proves that. It's Strong's number 7725, and it means to turn back, to convert, to deliver, to repent. So from the going forth, from the beginning or the dawning of heaven's commandment to turn the people back and convert them unto the building, which is to build up literally or figuratively and to obtain children to obtain children for the kingdom. Unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Interesting. Did that happen? Right on time. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. What does he tell them? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If only they had had spiritual eyes to see it, it was the very words out of Daniel 9. From the moment that is uttered unto Messiah the Prince, the timing was perfect. And he said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Wasn't that his mission? Amen. Yes. All right. So we have the timing exactly. There was seven weeks after that. He goes into the wilderness 40 days. Then he comes out and he's calling his disciples. All of this is going on in the, that seven-week period, his initial core disciples. Then he begins his public ministry, and we have the 62 weeks where we are building the street and the wall. We see already some of how that was fulfilled with Yeshua teaching the Beatitudes as part of the spiritual rebuilding of the street and how to pray and the wall being showing the law of God in its beauty and living it. And then after the 62 weeks. Okay, now let's look at the, a few more of the words here. From the commandment the going forth of the commandment to restore, to re turn to repentance and to bring children into Jerusalem, being the, the bride of Christ in the bigger picture. Unto Messiah the Prince. Messiah is the anointed one and Prince is the front, the leader, the commander. Shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. He's going to, in this period of 62 weeks, build the street and the wall, and it will be difficult, even in troublous times. What does this spiritually represent? Jeremiah 6.16 talks about the street, which the word literally means the path, the way to walk in. 
Thus saith Yahweh, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. The wall is talked about in Proverbs 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. A city's defenses were its walls. If we have no walls, we have no protection. What is the wall of our protection? The rule. This is a reference to the commandments. And so in Isaiah 42, 21, we read, Yahweh is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. This was a prophecy of the work of Messiah. And so we do see that going on in that 62-week period and the fulfillment of it. And then, after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. Now let's get back to our Genesis story. I told you that there was a prophecy in Genesis to consider. Is there a prophecy in Genesis that you can think of regarding Yeshua's death? Yes, Isaac, Isaac, absolutely. Remember the, the trip that a father and son took, a journey. And what a heavy journey it must have been for that father. But because he knew what Isaac didn't, that Isaac was to be the sacrifice. Genesis 22, 2, And Yahweh said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now, does Yahweh know where Yeshua will die? Oh, yes. Precisely. Did you know that Abraham took Isaac to that precise spot? And it was on that spot when Isaac asked the question, Father, we've got the wood, we've got the fire, where's our sacrifice? And he says, Genesis 22, 7, a prophecy, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. Boy, was that true. And so we see that very same thing happening with Yeshua, fulfilling the type of Isaac. The wood of the sacrifice is placed upon him, and he carries it where? Well, I'm going to get into this a whole lot more when we get to our 63rd week in our study, but I just want to point this out right now. The map of Mount Moriah is Calvary, and the location of Solomon's temple being right here, excuse me, right here, and the Mount Moriah right here. Coming out, this is where he carried the wood of the sacrifice up to the mountain and his location for his death. And God says to Abraham, go out to a mountain that I will tell you of. Yes, he knows the end from the beginning. All right, now let's look a little bit more carefully at the timing of that sacrifice. The midst of the week, the midst there are two keys from Daniel 9, after the 62 weeks, and then in the midst of the week. Midst means half, middle, midst with two equal parts on either side. What day of the week has two equal parts on either side of it? Wednesday. Only one day. <laughs> Some have wondered if maybe it was a Thursday, possibly it was a Friday, but in the seven-day week that Yahweh made at creation, there is only one day that is truly in the midst of the week. The fourth day or Wednesday. Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Let's count it out. Day one, if you're going with the traditional story, would have been, I guess, Friday, although you can you really call it Friday since it was only part of the day? We'll be generous. We'll call it day one. Then there's night one, Friday night. Day two would have been Sabbath itself. Night two would be Saturday night. And then there's Sunday 
Well, if we're generous and say that even though he resurrected supposedly on the sunrise, that that this was the third day, so he touched part of the day, we'll count it. Even if we're generous, it still isn't three days and three nights. There's no way to make it, even with generosity, be three days and three nights. It is a fatal error. It is a fatal error. Um, interestingly enough, you can use the U.S. Naval Observatory and you can use to confirm this. Um, I also, we have different astronomy software. We use the same software that um, the U.S. Naval Observatory was being used, was using and is quoted here at JudaismVersusChristianity.com Passover dates um, to determine how to find Passover for the year that he died. Now, some claim it was 33 AD because of the fact that there was a solar eclipse in 33 AD. But dear ones, there can never be a solar eclipse on Passover. And how do you know that? Because a solar eclipse cannot take place with a full moon. And there's always a full moon on the 14th day, right? So you're not looking for a solar eclipse. The sun went dark, but that was a miracle, not a solar eclipse. So 33 AD uh, is no longer needed. 31 AD is another year that people typically use. And 31 AD, I, I was curious at this time, I didn't know for sure about the 490 days. So I just wasn't sure if it was 31 AD or if it was 28 AD. I had been raised to believe 31 AD and we thought that. And so I thought, okay, this will settle it for me. I know he died in the midst of the week. So I'm curious which year of the two was, the was Passover on a Wednesday? Guess what I found? <laughs> it was a Wednesday, both years. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the new moon, uh, the first new moon of the year in 28 AD was Thursday, April 15. And if you um, count then from there, you would have your Passover on Wednesday, April 28. And if you have your new moon for the 31 AD, um, your first new moon would have been April 12, which was also a Thursday. And that would bring you your 14-day count again to Wednesday, only this time it was April 25. So I wasn't able to definitively figure out the year that he died by that. But we've been able to figure it out other ways. <laughs> and it was definitely a Wednesday Passover. And so I want to remind you, we've prov proven the 28 AD crucifixion in five different powerful ways. And anything can be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Five is pretty significant when scripture is that clear. Actually, four of these are scripture. One of them is history. I want to remind you at this stage about the importance of the order of operations. Um, there is a principle that is being used in the crucifixion story that is forgetting the order of operations. And just as you will get a wrong answer in math, if you do not do the math problem in the right order, so you will get a wrong conclusion in Bible study if you forget that everything has to be started in the Torah and the other details of that order of operations. So in math, the order of operations are if there's parentheses and brackets, do those first. If there's exponents, do those second. If there's any multiplication and division, do that third. And if there's addition and subtraction, do that fourth. So if you don't have any parentheses and you don't have any exponents, you just have multiplication and addition, what would you do first? Okay. Multiplication. So here's a case in point. Two plus five times six if you did it without the order of operations, as I showed you in the, in the past study, you might say two plus five is seven and seven times six then would be the next answer. And if you multiplied that, you would get 42. So you would say two plus five times six is 42, but actually your math book would say it isn't. That was done with the wrong order. If instead you said, okay, I'm supposed to multiply first. So five times six is the first step. Then five times six is what? 30. And then you add. What's left to add is just plus two. 30 plus two is? 30 plus two is 32. So the answer is big difference. 42 and 32. And which one's right? The 32. So we see the order of operations is critically important.
So you have in Bible study the importance of remembering the order of operations. How can you determine what's supposed to go on in the crucifixion story? You need to go back where? You go back to the Torah. Okay? So how do we know the timing that Yeshua was going to be taken down off the cross? Because he kept the Torah in every step, even in his death. God made sure. In Galatians 3.13, we read that Yeshua what hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. So was he accursed when he hung on the cross? Yes. yes. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So Paul links the Torah with Yeshua's death. Well, where does it talk about being cursed when you hang on a tree in the Torah? It's in Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 23. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, which Yeshua had not done, and if he be put to death, which he was, because he died for our sins, which were worthy of death, and thou hang him on a tree. Was he hung on a tree? Yes. yes. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is accursed is accursed of God, that thy land not, be not defiled, which Yahweh thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So I want you to notice a couple of things. One, his body could not stay on the tree all night. When did he have to be buried? The very day, the very day that he died. We've often talked about how there was a Sabbath coming and they were rushing to get him into the tomb because of the Sabbath. But there was perhaps an even deeper rule that had to be addressed because maybe they could have just left him on there on, on all through. Um, what was the hurry? Um, respect, I suppose. But they were working to get all of them down, including the thieves. And the reason was in Deuteronomy 21. These people had been hung and they were not to leave them through the night. They had to be taken off the tree that day. Do you see them fulfilling that? Yes, they're getting them down. The timing is not always clear, but it's very clear when you remember your order of operations. Yeshua kept the Torah in every way, and even in his death, he was a perfect, perfect fulfillment of it. So, what day did he die? Passover that year was a Wednesday. Is that fulfilling the midst of the week? Is it the day which has equal portions on both sides? Well, here's Wednesday, and you have three days before it. And here's Wednesday, and you have three days after it. This additional day is part of the next week. Okay? So he's put into the tomb... And he's put into, he was killed on the day of Passover. In fact, it even tells you in the evening that the Passover lamb is to be killed. So towards the end of the day, and they have to get him down from the cross and bury him before the night. Because he has to be buried that day. So are they hurrying to get him off the cross? They are hurrying. And that's why you see the ladies can't finish f preparing his body. So they get him down and he is indeed buried. He enters the tomb, not in the day, but the first night is counted. So how many days and nights does he need to be in the tomb? Three, three days and three nights. Thursday night was the first night. Excuse me, Wednesday night was the first night. Thursday night was the second night. And Friday night was the third night. The next um, will count the days. The whole day of Thursday was the first day. The whole day of Friday was the second day. And he came out of the tomb on Sabbath, 72 hours precisely from when he went in. Three days and three nights. This was the evidence that Yeshua said would authenticate that he is indeed the Messiah. He did not fulfill any part of the Phrygian crucifixion story. There is no overlap with him and Tammuz. There's no, there's no part of Tammuz's story that should be incorporated in Yeshua. 
An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given it but the sign of Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Then, as I mentioned, there's an issue that they say that Matthew 12, 40 didn't say three days and three nights in the original text. Now, um, I have... Um, I have two versions I'd like to show you. There's argument about which is older, and both of them are older than the Greek. One is the Aramaic, and we know that the New Testament is largely translated from Aramaic because many times the translators tell you which in Aramaic is which is translated from Aramaic to be da 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 da, like Eli Eli Lama Sabachthani, which was a crucifixion statement. So you can see they're translating from Aramaic. But there is an argument that perhaps, especially in the book of Matthew, that it might have been originally written in Hebrew. And so this is a statement on that, biblicaldefense.org. Papias, a direct disciple of John, wrote of his discussions with persons who spoke with apostles such as Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, James, John, or Matthew. And Papias, I'd probably, that's how I would say it, stated that Mark received the information for his gospel from the apostle Peter himself, Papias also related that Matthew originally recorded his gospel in Hebrew, but that it was later translated into Greek to reach a wider audience. Interestingly enough, in Iraq, they did find a uh, Hebrew version of the book of Matthew, which they dated and found to be older than the Greek. And so it's called Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. There's some debate about it, but I will tell you just to show you that this is older than the Greek, and this is how Matthew 12:40 reads in the translation from Shemtov's Hebrew Matthew. It says, "For as Yona, there's no J's, was three days and three nights in the stomach of the great fish, so shall the son of Adam be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth." In addition, let's look at it in Aramaic. I'm using the Aramaic English New Testament, which I have the copy over there. We have this exact book, and in Matthew 12:40, it says. For as Yonan was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, likewise the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So there's no validity to the statement that it really didn't say that. The length of time is accurate. Now, the question is, where's the heart of the earth? And um, so... Uh, that, that has to be dealt with. In Psalm 63, 9 to 10, it says, But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. When you're a portion for foxes, what are you? Dead. When you fall by the sword, what are you? Dead. And when you're dead, if you're being eaten by the foxes, are you literally in the bowels of the earth? No, your body's on the ground. But there's a Hebrew expression. When you die, you go into the lower parts of the earth. That's the expression. It doesn't literally mean that your body is in the latitude and longitude center of the earth. Well, not latitude. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. So Matthew 12, 40 to 41, what is the heart of the earth? Some say the heart is not the grave because some proponents of the Friday crucifixion define the heart to be the seat of one's emotions. They say the heart of the earth is Jerusalem, and so we need to consider the Bible definition. Um, was Yeshua in Jerusalem three days and three nights? No. Uh, in Mark 11, 11, day one, he entered the city, overlooked the temple, and went to Bethany. Um, Mark 11, 12 to 13, day two, he cleansed the temple and went to Bethany. On day three, he returned to Jerusalem and remained there at this point until his death. And Mark uh, 14, 1 talks about days four and five. And Mark 14, 1 talks about day six, which was the day he would have been on the cross. Now let's look it up in the Zodiatus and the Lexicon. Matthew 12, 40, Zodiatus, heart, in the heart of the earth. Lexicon word is cardia. The heart can be intention, affection, desire. It can also mean the middle or inner part as the heart is in relation to the breast. But then it specifically references Matthew 12, 40. And it says, as the heart of the earth is the inner part of the earth, the grave. So it's a Hebrew expression 
that even your lexicon aides will explain to you means the grave. Um, there are many times when in languages we use idioms. And uh, like if I said, that's cool, as I explained before, and I don't mean the temperature. I mean that that was a neat concept. So uh, idioms can't be taken in a literal sense. Now, this is from the earlychristianwritings.com. And it says, the Encyclopedia of Jewish Symbols states, these sea monsters have many names, Tanim, Dragon, Rahav, Expanse, and Yam. Um, but, the common, but the most common name is Leviathan. And in the book of Revelation, Leviathan is called Abaddon, the king of destruction or corruption, who comes up from the abyss or sea. Abaddon is the beast of the sea, that old serpent whose abode is an expanse, literally the grave. So Yeshua was comparing himself and his situation to Jonah's in every sense. The heart of the earth and the whale's belly were Hebrew idioms known to have represented Leviathan, or figuratively, the grave. In fact, he said he was in the belly of the behemoth. <laughs> Not pleasant. Um... And so it's figuratively the grave and death. And it was associated with the word yam, the sea, or the abyss. Ezekiel 27, 4 says, Thy borders are in the midst, the heart, the Hebrew equivalent of Matthew's heart or midst of the sea. And Jonah 2, 3 says, They cast him into the midst of the sea. Does that mean that he was literally in the center of the sea? No, only that he is covered, you know. So we can't take heart to always be exact dead center. Now, the next argument against the three days and three nights teaching is that in Psalm 1610, the Bible clearly te teaches that Yeshua would not see corruption. It says, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. If you recall the story of Lazarus, he was in the, the grave after three days. What? He stinks. There's corruption. So there's a problem, they're saying, with the three days and three nights teaching because there would have been corruption to the body. Well, actually, according to the way the Hebrews think of things, it only takes six hours without refrigeration after death before a body begins to show corruption, and scientists can find it before then. And so actually what we are seeing is that Yeshua had to be supernaturally protected. Was the manna supernaturally protected from corruption? Wasn't that a shadow picture of his body? Hosea 6, 1 and 3. Come and let us return to Yahweh, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. And after he will revive us after two days. He will raise up on the third day that we may live before him. And in Hosea 13, 14, I will ransom them from the power of Sheol, which is the pit of corruption. I will redeem them from death. O death, where are your thorns? O Sheol, where, your sting, where is your sting? According to Hosea, anytime you're in death, you are in the pit of corruption. So death in any phase is the pit of corruption. The only thing that would keep Yeshua from experiencing corruption is if he were miraculously protected like the manna. And that, I believe, God can do. What do you think? Amen. The Bible account of the crucifixion fulfills the Bible feast shadow pictures perfectly. Yeshua actually died on Passover. He actually was waved before the Father on first fruits. He resurrected on the Sabbath. The world is synchronized by God's time clock. The creator is running the universe by his time clock, not by the time clock of people. And whether we are aware of it or not, it is in effect. His people will know ahead of time when things will happen because God, God's people always know his clock. How? Because he gives the prophecies. Has he given Daniel chapter 9 as the prophecy for Messiah's arrival and death and all of that? Did he not fulfill it perfectly? Amos 3, 7 says, Surely Yahweh will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 4, it says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Now, this is Greek, of course, but if you were reading in the Old Testament and you read the word seasons, you would have a pretty good guess what that was from. 
what would it be from? What would be the Hebrew word if this were an Old Testament reference to seasons? It would be Moedim, feasts. Leviticus 23 gives us a good list of them. These are the Moedim. So this is a Greek uh, translation, English translation from Greek, but I just want to point out what seasons would have meant if it was in the Old Testament. It says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you, ha you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of Yahweh so cometh as a thief in the night. So everyone says, you're going to be shocked. You won't know when he's coming. Let's keep reading. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Who is surprised by the timing of his coming? The people who are in darkness. The people who are in darkness, spiritually. Who is not surprised about the timing of his coming? The people who know the times and seasons, his children. Interesting. That is a way of telling you that he always fulfills his days on his days. So if you know his times and seasons, you will be children of the light. That's part of it, a big ingredient anyway. And also what happens on them is in the keeping of them. In Leviticus 23, 2, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feasts of Yahweh, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. You look up the word convocation. Yes, it does mean a gathering. That's part of the meaning. And we do gather and, and worship him. But it also means a rehearsal. And you know what? It's that too. A rehearsal. What is a rehearsal? Well, if you're going to have a school program with school children, you know you don't want to just skip straight from, well, kids, we're going to be having a program. Okay, go on home now. You don't want to do that. If you do, what, what can you expect of your program? <laughs> It'll be a disaster. Nobody knows when, when they're supposed to be on cue to do anything. Nobody knows their lines. Nobody can pull off any part of the program with any success. It's a chaotic experience. However, if you have rehearsals, the children are taught their cues. They go through the motions of doing what they're going to be doing at the final. They've done it all ahead several times. And, and you even have a dress rehearsal or two where they come in, in and they have their cues and they have their costumes and they know exactly what it's supposed to look like and what to do. That's what a rehearsal is. And Yahweh has given us that in the feast. Did we know when he was going to die? Yes, because we had the dress rehearsal. The Passover lamb was killed at the precise time. It was the exact age that he would be as our Passover lamb, etc., etc. It was every piece of the rehearsal fulfilled. Every piece. And that's how it will always be. What are the rehearsals? The seventh day Sabbath, the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. The rain of the flood began falling on the Feast of Trumpets. Man's or Yah's? Yahweh's. Yahweh delivered his people from Egypt by sending the death angel through the land and by stopping the Egyptians. That all happened with a blood covering on Passover. The actual leaving of Egypt happened on the first Sabbath of unleavened bread. Yahweh spoke his law from Mount Sinai on Pentecost. Elijah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and many other prophets were born on feast days. Yeshua was born on the first Sabbath of tabernacles and he was circumcised on the eighth day, the last great day. Yeshua really died on Passover. The Jews were keeping Passover then too because they did have the calendar right, but it was heaven's Passover. And the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples on Pentecost. And just as Daniel says, at the time appointed, the end shall be on the Moedim will come the end. Do you know when the probation will close for the world? On the Day of Atonement. Do you know when the Feast of the Watchmen will be fulfilled and the trumpets begin to sound, etc., etc., and the, oh my. Do you know when the King will return? Tabernacles. Do you know when you will get to, by Yah's grace, enter the kingdom of heaven and drink of the water of life for the first time? On the last great day. And yes, it really will happen on the day. 
That's Yahweh's pattern. It always has. And so the devil has worked to destroy mankind's understanding of Yahweh's clock. This is darkness. There's Good Friday, which is Dagon's day, replacing the true crucifixion on Passover. There's Easter Sunday, which is Estre's day, replacing the timing of the true resurrection, which happened on Shabbat. Do you know the whole reason why Sunday keepers keep Sunday? They believe the resurrection happened on Sunday and that the resurrection of Yah is uh, a powerful enough thing to commemorate, which it, which it is, but they justify the changing of the day. But he didn't even resurrect on that day. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all the world for a witness and then shall the end come. People need to know the truth. Amen. The truth supports Yahweh's calendar. Heaven gave it. And heaven is still keeping it. Yes, the same gospel that was taught by Yeshua and his disciples is to be lived and taught by God's people today. Before his return, it will go to the whole earth. May we all be part of sharing it and living it. And yes, there was only one sign given of Messiah's authenticity. Only one. The sign of Jonah. And yes, he did fulfill it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help us to be delivered from all of the Babylonian myths that have come into the gospel story, and that we can have the true gospel, the everlasting gospel of your kingdom. Live it, give it, and shine it in a time when Earth's history is at its darkest and getting darker by the day. You did not intend for your people to be in darkness. If we are, your return will come as a thief, and that was not your design. So I pray, Father, that we will be children of the light, children of the day, because we are mindful, observant of, and keeping your seasons, your appointed times. Glory to your holy name. Amen.